Grace and peace to you, dear friends, from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. God knows life is full of hard work. It's good for us, it's edifying, it's healthy. Regular freedom from work, though, was foreign to these ancient people who had just been slaves. And I think it's also a little bit foreign to us in our own modern culture, where so many of us labor continuously to make ends meet. Work is a blessing that can turn into a curse when there is no opportunity for rest. God knows that we need renewal and safety and space to catch our breath. Throughout the Psalms, the best work of the Holy Spirit is that the Spirit places God's people in broad places for the renewal of our souls. This commandment, given thousands of years ago, is important to God's people today. Though the second commandment given is about not worshiping false idols, the idols all around us, busyness, perfection, enoughness, striving, endlessly comparing ourselves and what we have to our neighbors and what they have or what they deserve or what we deserve or what we all deserve or what I don't have or what I want or what I need, the resentment of feeling passed over or ignored. For my family, the martyr complex runs deep and strong. <laughs> it's in the bloodline, wanting everyone to see how hard you work and how good you are and that you never need help and never having quite enough recognition. God's spirit says to those idols and our endless scrambling, enough. <laughs> Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Sanctify one day a week where you put God at the center and you dwell in that perfect love. There's a lot of observing going on in our gospel text for today. For some reason, some intense lovers of the law, the Pharisees, are in this random grain field watching Jesus and his every move. I have a lot of empathy for the Pharisees. Their people kept getting put into exile or attacked by enemy nations, and the prophets are always begging God's people to follow God's laws, to take justice and mercy and kindness and right living seriously. The Israelites of every age, human beings of every nation, we struggle to observe God's good commandments. Well, the Pharisees are lurking in this grain field, knowing that these disciples of Jesus are going to make a misstep. There are 39 activities that the ancient scholars categorized as work in Israel. Guess what the top 11 have to do with? <laughs> Farming, harvesting. The top 11 Prohibitions are plowing, planting, harvesting, gathering, threshing, sifting, selecting, winnowing, grinding, kneading, ultimately all leading to baking, which is a no-no. So the disciples have harvested and gathered some grain. They picked the heads off the grain so that would count as threshing. They probably crushed the grain in their hands, so that's grinding. They might as well open a bakery. Don't they know anything about the Sabbath and how to keep it holy? Number 36 on the naughty list is kindling a fire. It takes a wild amount of preparation to keep the Sabbath day kosher and safe. And as our world has gotten more and more complex, my Orthodox Jewish friends have had to get more and more creative as electricity and elevators and crockpots. Crockpots are great, actually. For, for everybody. But. Modern Jewish people have to think ahead. Make all the food. Get that hot plate heated up to keep all the meals warm for Saturday. Make sure the lights are on that you're going to need ahead of time because you can't switch them on and off. Make sure your furnace is running smoothly and it's been serviced because you can't turn that on and off. Again, thank God for crock pots. If that's the only thing you remember, great. There is to be no creative work 
or physical labor done at all. That takes forethought and care. But the disciples are hungry. I often wonder why they didn't plan ahead. If they knew the Sabbath always arrives on the seventh day, it could be that Peter's mother-in-law was annoyed that he left her daughter behind in Capernaum. Could be that Mary and Martha were busy. We don't meet Mary Magdalene in Mark's gospel until the crucifixion, so we don't know where she is. In Luke's gospel, we meet Mary Magdalene in chapter 8, but all that is mentioned is that Jesus frees her from demons and she sticks close to him out of gratitude. Jesus says to these Pharisees, waiting for him to mess up, the Sabbath was made for humankind. It was made for you, and not the other way around. And by the way, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. If someone is hungry and does not have a stable environment with which to prepare the Sabbath, to harvest the grain, to knead the dough, light the fire, well, the Sabbath day was given for healing and liberation. In the book of Deuteronomy, the reason to remember the Sabbath is not the same as the one given the first time in the book of Exodus. The Decalogue, or the ten words in Exodus, exhorts God's people to remember the Sabbath because God himself rested on the seventh day, and they were to marvel at all God had made, the land, the people, the creatures, the cosmos. Deuteronomy says, you shall not do any work You or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox or your donkey or any of the livestock or the resident alien in your towns. And often in the Jewish study Bible, it's translated as your strangers living in your towns. So the responsibility is on us. So that people may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Use the Sabbath day to remember that your God is merciful, that your God frees real people from real bondage, that God uses the Sabbath day to smash up all of our idols and return us to himself. Remember that God looks upon suffering and acts. If we serve a God that responds to human suffering with such compassion and such righteousness, then how shall we spend our Sabbath days? The Pharisees observe Jesus and his wrong steps instead of observing that the disciples are hungry and in need. Mark's gospel then jumps ahead to a future Sabbath day, and the disciples and Jesus are back in Capernaum. Jesus entered the synagogue for a day of learning and Sabbath fellowship, which is totally lawful and wonderful. The Pharisees, or some other group annoyed with Jesus, because there were probably a lot of them, are lurking again. And the text says they were watching to see if Jesus was going to cure this man on the Sabbath. Now, what would be a natural thing for the Lord with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm to do? He asks this man to stretch out his arm and his hand for healing and renewal. It's what the Sabbath day is for, healing. Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, asks, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? And the crowd is silent. Then the text says, Jesus looks around, which is parablepome, which is an intense word. Jesus uses an intense, sweeping, observing, watchful gaze. No one speaks up. God is so grieved about this silence. Here is a suffering brother and they were content to keep the status quo rolling. The Pharisees leave immediately ready to write up a report, if they would be allowed to write a report on Sabbath, which you are not allowed to do. So they muttered to themselves to keep their thoughts in their brains about how they were going to bring this Jesus down once and for all. 
I was so struck by all the observing going on. How do we spend our sacred Sabbath day? Do we show up ready and open for learning, for service, for fellowship, to build up this fragile body of Christ at Transfiguration? Are we ready to observe the things that matter? Observe any suffering or hurts of other people and pray that God could activate our many gifts so that we can respond with kindness and patience and grace. Are we watching and waiting for our neighbor to mess up so that we can fill ourselves up with self-righteousness and pat ourselves on the back for having it all together? Or do we take God's command to keep the Sabbath holy by becoming the keeper of our brothers and sisters in this place? Are you busy looking over at your neighbor's bowl to see if they have more than you? Are you missing out on God's miraculous provision for your life? Will we sit in silence unmoved by our family? Are we willing to grieve God's heart? Will we allow our neighbors to hold tightly to their hurts like the man with the withered hand, or will we help them bear their burdens? Are we looking over shoulders or are we looking out for one another? How will you embrace and share the healing, the rest, the renewal, the joy that God promises every morning made new? The Sabbath looks back to the origins of freedom. It looks forward to the ultimate Sabbath, eternal life in the very presence of God. Let us be people that create space, that create sanctuary. Let us be people that create space to breathe. Let us be people that care about health and strength and joy for this place and for each other. God gave the Ten Commandments to liberated people so that they could know how to stay free. Let's be freed people delighting in the provision and graciousness of God, desiring that freedom and enoughness and claimedness and chosenness that is spread out like a picnic blanket before all the nations. Thanks be to God for the wonders that have found us and for the wonders that are yet to come. Amen. <laughs>